Okay then, so welcome everyone to another of our keynote interviews for the 50 plot shades of Gothic conference series organized by PubMec. Today for our thematic session, Houses Gothic Locust and the Uncanny and the US Family, we are delighted to introduce Dr. Kevin Korserfeen. Kevin, thank you so much for being here today and for accepting to do this. Uh, we are really grateful to have you. Thank you so much. It's a real honor. I'm, I'm really pleased to, <laughs> to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kevin Korserfeen is a lecturer in American Literature at the University of Paul and Program Director in American Studies. His research interests lie in horror and Gothic fiction, both literary and popular, and he is particularly interested in representations of space and place, environment, and haunted locations. He has published widely on authors including Bram Stoker, H.P. Lovecraft, Ambrose Beers, Shelley Jackson, Stephen King, and Clive Barker. He was the co-editor for the Paul Gray Handbook to Horror Literature, published in 2018, and which I hugely recommend. And he is currently working on several research projects, including US imperialism, haunted graveyards, and the use of dungeon spaces and gaming. So uh, some great stuff here. And uh, yeah, let's just crack on with our interview. So uh, the general overarching theme today is the idea of the Gothic national domestic. So for our first question, I wanted to mention Amy Kaplan's notion of manifest domesticity, uh, which she, uh, obviously she's playing with the idea of manifest destiny and she coined it to talk about 19th century literature, but it's relevant for her purposes today because it explains how the nation is construed as, and I quote, a domestic space imbued with a sense of at-homeness, unquote. Um, this sense is always construed in opposition to an alien threatening outside world. And this is similar to your own uh, definition of the Gothic as something foreign and uh, uh, threatening as well as a destroyer of civilized values. So these kind of words like foreign um, or civilization immediately take us to the realm of um, citizenship, nationhood and belonging. So considering that you've written that horror is everywhere, um, I wanted to ask you about the, specific, the specificity of the US Gothic. So my question is, um, how has the Gothic genre helped either to create or to debunk ideologies of the domestic versus the foreign? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. One I was kind of struggling to think about, so the US as home uh, versus the foreign. What we've seen a lot in political discourse lately has been demonization of a couple of specific foreign groups, haven't we? We've seen uh, Mexico in particular and the anxieties around the, the border wall, which is such a kind of blatant symbol of defining us against them, it's almost kind of laughable, it's this kind of physical symbol. And anxieties over immigration, particularly from Islamic countries, of course, with uh, Trump's uh, famous uh, Muslim ban. And both of these are kind of linked to ideas of savagery, absolutely, versus civilization, aren't they? The threat of the terrorist. Uh, Trump's famous um, decrying of immigrants as murderers and rapists uh, coming through uh, either from Mexico or through Mexico from South America. And so you absolutely have this construction of the home territory, the domestic uh, versus the invader. But this is kind of set up in a very kind of oxymoronic or contradictory way to the founding of the US, of course, isn't it? Because we're dealing with an immigrant nation, we're dealing with a melting pot of different cultures. So I was thinking about your question and sort of, I keep coming back to the idea of the Native American, uh, even though that we're talking about with, within the borders, but you know, the, the Western, the cowboy versus the Indian is the narrative that the US has given the world and the most, it's a very kind of flattening and simplifying narrative, but a very powerful one, isn't it? Of the um, strong stoic uh, frontiersmen versus these forces of savagery. So just thinking about domesticity uh, and the home, I'm, I'm drawn back to those ideas of how early American culture is dealing with the legacy of, of displacing, of, of killing, of uh, stealing uh, essentially um, native lands and the ensuing anxieties because it's so obvious in American Gothic isn't it we're back to this 
idea of the old Indian burial ground, one of those, you know, classic um, motifs, which are, and this is what I love about popular Gothic, right? It's almost so obvious that it doesn't bear analysis, but then the more you do it, the more it comes out of what's actually going on there. So this kind of typical story of someone moving into land which they invest all their hopes into the amityville horrors you know they, they literally call the house high hopes and then they discover this this kind of horrific past or that, that there's ownership of uh, native americans before then and they become kind of haunted um and that initial guilt is i mean it's how american gothic is often defined isn't it i'm thinking about people like Teresa Godu, I'm thinking about Leslie Fiedler's uh, Love and Death in the American novel and that famous um, idea that uh, American literature is, what does he call it, embarrassingly and bewilderingly a gothic fiction. So it's resting on these, these twin anxieties about the injustices of slavery and the injustices of the appropriation of native land. How does all this tie into ideas of foreignness? Well, I, what I'm getting at is this construction of a mainstream culture, of a dominant culture, which is defined against something else, something savage, uh, something uncivilized. And it, it tends to reveal more about the, that culture, uh, I think, than, than is intended to. Um, Thinking about something like um, Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, um, there's there's this line in that that I absolutely love, where um, and I noted this down, <laughs> but uh, they're talking about the land, and um, they said uh, the the wife says, "Honey, do we own this?" And the husband, uh, the neighbor says, "It's part of the property." Oh yes, and the husband uh, Lewis says, "It which wasn't quite the same thing." So kind of who owns land? and who has the right to build and work on the land is absolutely foundational to the American project. I'm thinking as well, just to throw that in, that, that whole idea of lock and this, this idea of the private property is land mixed with labor. And I, I find that almost kind of haunting, you know, that you can, you can put your labor into um, a, a space or a place and it becomes somehow yours but then that's a contested um, property and it literally is because that's the doctrine used to take land from from native peoples um, so I think this is bound up um, together with the kind of fear of the native guilt of of the native over uh, history and projection onto onto borders. It's all in a, in a stew, which does uh, build up this idea of the home as civilization and a specifically US kind of civilization. Themes that I hope we have the chance to unpack later, but uh, yeah, I basically agree with, with everything that you said. And um, we've, talking, we've been talking about this binary uh, of civilization, versus uh, savagery you were mentioning and uh, several iterations, but I wanted to move to a more general level and ask you how you feel about the triangulated relationship between pop culture, the Gothic and the nation. So what happens when we add this element of popular culture to this sort of formula? Absolutely. Um, and many of these texts that we've come to talk about have been um, very popular. Well, as, as we are talking about as, as pop culture scholars, you know, I mentioned something like uh, the Amityville Horror. I've been thinking a lot lately about things like thrillers as well. I just saw uh, a new thriller movie called Run about uh, a wheelchair user who is kind of trapped in, in, in the home. It's kind of a rear window kind of <laughs> done over again. But this, this kind of idea that there's something horrible lurking below the surface is not specific to some kind of weird gothic realm of kind of you know fans of of something um you know offbeat this is completely mainstream and so are some of the ideas that we're thinking about i think 
one of the questions I keep asking myself, so in, in Gothic studies, and I, I, our listeners will be very familiar with all this, we talk very freely, don't we, about anxiety and cultural anxiety, as we do in, in lots of pop culture scholarship, but we don't often kind of put that under the microscope quite enough, and, and there's, I, I worry that we talk too generally, how can we all be suffering this, this anxiety um, all, all of the time? But I do think the idea has, has um, validity. I was thinking lately about the, we've seen a lot of controversy over statues in the US and statues of um, Confederate soldiers, white supremacists and so on, which um, absolutely we can see um, what's going on there. But it was extended to Christopher Columbus and this is the really interesting thing. So we go right back to the discovery um, of the US and seeing Columbus in this light as um, someone who was basically a criminal kind of uh, sailing out to, to, to conduct his own ventures and, and guilty of the, the death and displacement of, of, in the end, millions of people. And the thing is, all of this is exactly true and everybody knows it, and yet we kind of turn a collective blindness to it. We, we become comfortable um, with the myth. Even though it's, like I say, not a kind of an unusual belief to think, yes, we are living in the kind of the, the, the bad timeline. You know, the, we are living in the one where the bad guys have won and we've essentially uh, built up a civilization out of this. Um, and all of these debates are very healthy, I think, to reassess our past and think about the stories that we're telling ourselves. But my point is in regards to the Gothic, that this is deeply Gothic and deeply mainstream uh, to think of the past in this way and to think of the foundations of uh, American society, um, particularly uh, in that way, um, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I asked the question, like separating those three terms, but I really do not think that you can think of the Gothic without the popular culture element. I think it's just part of the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, we've been talking about um, the nation in general terms, following this metaphor of uh, nation as home. And so now I'd like to focus on the inside of this home and talk about the regional Gothic, um, which is one of the most pervasive ways of uh, um, Gothic culture in the US. So um, the dominant culture uh, in the United States has tended to identify the national identity with certain regions or certain landscapes like the West, for instance, the 19th century or the suburban landscape more recently, especially ever since the post-war era. So obviously uh, these issues probably because uh, they relate to very exclusionary processes of nation building have been treated in Gothic terms. Um, you mentioned uh, Teresa Gatto before, and she has argued that uh, the American Gothic is the most recognizable as a regional form. And thinking of the many iterations that uh, the regional Gothic has in the US, so uh, the New England Gothic, Southern Gothic, Frontier Gothic, etc. Uh, how, uh, how do you think uh, Gothic relates to questions of space, uh, region and landscape in the US? Yeah, it's a, a fascinating question. I think, it, you know, when I talk to people who, who haven't studied Gothic, perhaps literary specialists, the, the, the first thing that has sprung to mind for many years is the Southern Gothic. That is the, the quintessential and established uh, version of what the Gothic is in, in the US. And it works so well for that, doesn't it? It's like the Freudian id. It's the the, the dark secrets, the, uh, and those themes of the past, obviously, we're dealing again with the legacy of slavery, um, we're dealing with poverty and inequality, um, family secrets, uh, and so on, just that, that, that sense, even in, again, in mainstream literature, thinking about something like um, A Streetcar Named Desire, where Blanche Dubois has this hidden past that she tries to gloss over, and then um, secrets are exposed, we get, we get madness and, and, and so on. Um, so the Southern Gothic, it's, it's no wonder that, that has, has, has had that past and it's had that scholarly attention. Um, I think with the rise of more and more 
studies in the Gothic lately, um, we've seen, for instance, the, the New England circle of, of writers brought to the fore. And other exciting explorations of things like Californian Gothic, texts in Gothic, so very specific um, regional um, elements to it. But I think, I mean, to come back to Southern Gothic, and I mentioned Mexico earlier, this idea of othering is, is, is really kind of baked into the Gothic from the start, isn't it? It's, we think about those original Gothic novels, the classic criticism has always associated them with uh, Protestant Britain um, demonizing uh, Catholic Europe, so Italy and and Spain full of mad monks and, uh, you know, uh, no, it's, it's you guys, lo siento, <laughs> it's, not, it's not me that's demonizing you. Um, but the, the, this, this place of darkness and superstition and is associated somehow with the past. And the American South has absolutely worked like that in the eyes of the North. Um, but, you know, Flannery O'Connor talked about this, a kind of a sense that, that Southern Gothic writers have had to play up to that image uh, for Northerners, that, that there, it's a genre of, of writing. Um, and, and I think that perspective works very well. I read a novel by um, Nick Cave. I don't know if anyone's read Nick Cave's novel, the, And the Ass Saw the Angel. Um, so although it's Australian, it's utterly um, American, Southern Gothic in its mood and in its tone. And I think that can be transported um, to all kinds of, of um, other countries and places. So I guess what I'm saying is that that regionally the US has also managed to establish uh, genres, tropes, modes of Gothic um, which um, go beyond um, the, the regions um, themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the West is uh, the most obvious example of this because of it's sort of transnational projection and people are talking about global west uh, post west and yeah how this sort of region has actually uh you know expanded to a planetary dimension um so just to, yeah sorry oh sorry I just, I just thought it's really interesting to think about the kind of revisionist western which has this right. kind of gothic take you know like Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian being such a, a, a gothic novel in so many ways in its worldview, essentially that everything's bleak and nothing means anything. <laughs> um, but the, the, this, um, yeah, again, comes back to, to, to my, what I was saying about, about the Western frontier and this Western narrative being exported uh, to the rest of the world. I've, I've no doubt we're becoming quite Americanized in terms of these stories, but. We also see regional resistance, but uh, that's a whole other topic. Right. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on this previous question, and I wanted to ponder about this slippage between the dominant culture and its identification with uh, these emblematic spaces and how other cultures or identities are erased from these spaces. So in your view, how does the Gothic intervene upon this problematic identification between uh, spaces and a national identity, which is an identity that is construed along specific uh, and restrictive gender, racial and class lines. Absolutely. We're, we're back to this kind of classic discussion over whether the Gothic is, is progressive in its politics or whether it simply demonizes the other and is reactionary in its um, in it, again, a demonization of social change. And I don't want to duck out that or sit on the fence, but I think clearly it does both uh, in, in terms of this. Um, space and geography, in terms of um, race, class, and, and gender, are so utterly fascinating in the way that they're inscribed. I've been thinking a lot about how in America, for example, you hear a lot about bad neighborhoods or the phrase sketchy neighborhoods is used a lot. And, you know, it means black neighborhoods. It's a racist um, term. And the ways in which space has been carved up in those racialized uh, terms is, has been gothicized. You know, we might think about um, that most 
racist and also important, the film's birth of a nation uh, and the use of um, African Americans as this, this kind of dangerous uh, force. But it's the Gothic lately has really been revising it in fascinating ways. I'm thinking most obviously of um, The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval, which rewrites um, H.P. Lovecraft's fiction, and in particular, um, the, um, the horror at uh, Red Hook. And he has a, an African-American character in that who's a jazz musician, and he's moving through different uh, areas of New York. And at one point he's in Harlem, he feels safe. So Harlem from the kind of white mainstream culture perspective could be seen as a dangerous place to be, but he's at home, he's very comfortable. As he moves out towards the suburbs into to very white areas, suddenly they become threatening and suddenly they become dangerous spaces. And what's so fascinating about that is that it really turns on its head this idea of non-white spaces as threatening, as places of danger, which you see in Lovecraft very obviously, um, and just shows this other perspective through an act of um, creative storytelling uh, as kind of revising of the story. Um, Matt Ruff's Lovecraft Country uh, does something very similar as well. I've not seen the TV show yet, so I can't quite comment, but I'm looking forward to, to that. Um, so yeah, I think, again, both, I think the Gothic can demonize and it can absolutely be a great vehicle to explore those very themes. And, and there's a lot of, of writing being done in that vein at the moment. That kind of taps into my next question, which is about Imperial Gothic. And uh, this is very, uh, it lends itself to this question of whether Gothic is actually progressive or conservative as Stephen King said, yeah, that thing about, you know, uh, the Gothic taps into your inner conservative Republican man inside of you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, now that we have looked at the inside of the nation as home, I wanna look at the outside and yeah, the question remains of how uh, the US as a nation sees this threatening um, outside. So uh, here I'd like to turn to uh, the Imperial Gothic as a term, which, uh, Johan Hoglund has defined as an engine of horror. And he's here taking his cue from uh, Patrick Bradlinger, who, if I'm not mistaken, uh, popularized this term to talk about uh, the British fears uh, during the 19th century about the crumbling empire. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, whether you see a correlation between this uh, reality in the uh, 19th century Great Britain and the current US um, uh, situation, imperial situation, or, you know, the situation of the U.S. within uh, the world as a world power. And yeah, I'm thinking especially of the mainstream film industry, which is quite prone to uh, imperialist narratives. So yeah, what are these fixations and obsessions of the U.S. imperial gothic according to, to you? Yeah, I, I don't want to oversimplify and conflating uh, these things, but I think you're absolutely right that there are the Gothic brings together certain uh, parallels. This kind of idea that there's a responsibility um, of that uh, the US sees itself as the, the world's policeman, as Britain did in the 19th century. Um, Kipling famously called it the white man's burden uh, to kind of civilize the world, and that oft criticized. Um, uh, quotation from that that poem but you know this this has parallels I was just I'm thinking about the, the film actually the film version of American Sniper the um, autobiography of Chris Kyle who's the most prolific um, US sniper uh, in, in military history in, in Afghanistan and it's it begins with this um, kind of powerful sounding, but, but very interesting quotation to dissect, where he says that uh, there are people in the world who are sheep, uh, there are people in the world who are wolves, and there are people in the world who are sheep dogs. Uh, so it wasn't actually from Chris Pell to begin with, it was from um, a US military strategist, but essentially that some of us are, are just docile citizens going about our business, 
some of us are, are wolves, terrorists, criminals, all lumped in together. And some of us are kind of essentially brave enough um, to, to take on this role of protector. And this sheepdog needs to both have the capacity for violence, but to also buy into the values of civilization. Now, again, I think this analogy works very well to, to, to start a film with. Uh, there's so much going on to unpack in there as to how you define um, what is this civilization. For one thing, it's quite a bleak view of civilization that we're all sheep. Um, we've, we've kind of domesticated ourselves. Another reason why we're probably kind of anxious about, about freedom of, of, of other cultures um, within uh, the US, for example, with Native American cultures. Um, but both of those set up this very masculine, very um, uh, presumptuous view uh, that you need to be stoical, that you need to kind of go out into the world and, and help to civilize it. Um, yeah, we, and in that, to come back to the Gothic, okay, so we set up that idea, but to come back to the Gothic, in those um, imperial era texts, you see bad things coming back. You see these people being tainted, most obviously in Heart of Darkness, um, where uh, Marlow um, comes back with this knowledge that Kurtz has gone native, that he's cut off heads and put them on sticks. He's brutalized the native people and yet he somehow absorbed their most brutal aspects but he protects Kurtz's wife from this so, so it, it has to stay there but he does have this vision that you know the Thames has become the heart of darkness somehow and you see this in, in all kinds of people like um, authors like Ri uh, Richard Marsh with uh, the Beetle and uh, the Joss um, but we also see it in contemporary American narratives um, the of trauma, particularly leading out of the the Gulf conflicts, uh, to come back to American Sniper, Chris Kyle uh, was killed by a traumatized veteran that he was trying to help, as we see in the film. And this whole kind of story of the trauma of war returning and affecting the the home nation is, I think, what's so compelling and so gothic. Uh, about those stories as well. And we see this everywhere. There's a film in the mid 80s called House, um, which is a horror movie. And it's about a Vietnam vet. And he's kind of haunted by his friend who, not that he couldn't help, he was, he could not bring himself to kill him because he was wounded and suffering. So he didn't have the kind of courage to do this dark act. And so he, he's haunted. Um, you see it in House of Leaves with the character of um, Will Nabidson that's playing on Kevin Carter with the picture of the girl being stopped by the vulture but, but not kind of helping. Um, this idea that there's something dark out there and that you might bring a piece of it back um, is, is a very compelling gothic one to, to that story, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um... As an example of these sort of uh, problems, I wanted to bring up 9-11, uh, which is probably one of the most obvious examples that you can think of. Um, and 9-11 uh, has been characterized as a gothic event uh, many times. And in a way, this has supported the Bush administration's um, racist narratives of you know, the war on terror and everything that that entailed. So, um, Again, going back again to the idea of reactionary versus progressive or transgressive, um, given how prone the Gothic can be to fuel reactionary discourses due to its power of othering, um, do you think that uh, the pop uh, culture Gothic can be used to offer um, cultural resistance to US imperialism? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely can. I think, I think it, it's, it, it is in this sense, isn't it, that of guilt, and we're coming back to this, this idea of, of Fiedler, and the, the other narrative, of course, about 9-11 um, is that this, and not to go down into the conspiracy theory route, but this is, this is coming from um, US intervention in, in the Middle East, going back a long way. Um, now, again, thinking about these narratives of trauma and drawn to uh, 
First Blood and, and the Rambo films, the third of which involves Rambo helping the Taliban to fight against the, the Soviet Union. So there's this sense that, um, that the kind of chickens are coming home to roost, not that you know, we want to kind of um, uh, justify any of this, but that if America is worried that there are religious fundamentalists out to kill Americans, then it's because of a situation created by American foreign policy. Um, and we might make the same comparisons with the British Empire uh, and, and, for example, British fears about immigration and kind of racial contamination. Um, you might say if, if you don't want to have a multicultural, uh, multiracial society, then, you know, starting a global empire is perhaps the wrong way to, <laughs> to, to, to go about that, um, that project. Um, and like I say, I'm coming back again to a mindset that we're somehow, we can be too complacent in thinking of the Gothic as just about being fearful of, of, of other things or, or about having a, a dark and gloomy mindset. There's something valuable about cynicism, I think. And the Gothic tells us that, you know, these, these narratives are being told of patriotism and of very simplified kind of jingoistic um, stories that 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 they're, they're nonsense and, and if, again if you scratch beneath that surface uh, then there's something else going on so there's definitely um, capacity uh, for resistance uh, in 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 that that kind of gothic storytelling yeah I agree and I think it has the potential to be both because um, even though the gothic can as you say, sort of um, give hints of uh, the absurdity of certain narratives. I also think that voyeuristic in that we are seeing, um, you know, this the deconstruction of certain things, but that doesn't bring about any real change. So yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting discussion. Um, so uh, I think this is probably a good place to leave it. I think we nailed the time. And uh, I'm sure the audience is eager to ask you some amazing questions. So yeah, um, I know that you know this, but as a brief reminder, uh, I'm talking to the audience now, you can type your questions on the chat feature and we can read them out for you or you can raise your hands uh, uh, reactions uh, feature and then I call out your names and you can just turn your cameras and mics on and ask your questions, whichever you guys prefer. Great, that was very, um very quick half hour of discussion. Yeah, it went by so fast. So many things to talk about. We could be here forever and never. Yeah, it's going to talk about Marvel movies, but I don't know. It's not uh, we have a question from Paul. Hi, can you see me? Can you hear me, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, had a few problems with my my audio so i hope you can hear me um really interesting to listen to your to your answers kevin i just want to ask you about about well i was, I was thinking very much in terms of a specific movie um which i don't know if you've seen obviously the movie is don't breathe have you come across that movie kevin that's that's very i might need a brief recap <laughs> it's, it's a movie it's made by uh, Fede alvarez who's a Uruguayan filmmaker, and he makes a film about, um, it's like a home invasion movie, where you get these kind of three, these three young, young adult characters who invade uh, this guy's house and realize that he's blind. And it turns out that he's a, movie, uh, that he's a, um, a military vet. Yes, and I did see that. what happens to them when they're in this house. Yeah. Did you come across that one? I did see that, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good, because, <laughs> um, what was just the, the things you were saying about trauma and that you were linking that very much to kind of issues of imperialism and and very much that kind of you know American foreign policy and and the role that veterans play within that the the, the promulgation of that narrative and I just wanted to ask you if you have seen the movie Don't Breathe in terms of the way in which you kind of perhaps respond to that within this context of of the domestic space fundamentally it's about a, a home invasion. But it's got this kind of greater sort of political militaristic narrative as well about about veterans about the kind of obviously the kind of 
the promulgation of, of American foreign policy. And I just wanted to ask really if, how you would respond to, to that particular movie. Yeah, thanks so much again for reminding me of it. I feel so bad about sort of all my kind of weekend nights watching movies and then blurring into each other a little bit. But I, I definitely seen that one. Thought so it was really interesting. It's got that kind of satisfied narrative as well, doesn't it? That that they've kind of messed with the wrong guy. It's it's that uh, it's bringing me back to those ideas of this necessity to be a a, a sheepdog, as as I was <laughs> mentioning in 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 that. Um, um, in terms of American sniper, but he didn't. He, he there was more to it, wasn't it? He he was actually quite sadistic, wasn't he? Or he was quite. Yeah, it kind of turns around that he's got kind of he's got a girl kind of um, that he, that he's kind of kidnapped um, and that he's got it tied up, and then you've got this whole thing. Then at the end, that turns around about you know where is the villain and where is you know where is the victim and. You know, it's quite, it's quite, a, a, that's what really what led the question, you know, in the sense in which, you know, as we say, the Gothic kind of, is it progressive? Is it, is it kind of actually regret, re reactionary? And it seems to be quite an interesting movie in the sense in which it's, it's really complex, you know, in, in what it's mm -hmm. actually perhaps trying to, to suggest about America and some of its attitudes perhaps. Well, I think that's that's absolutely yeah fascinating in terms of what we're talking about um, in, in this session with that kind of sense that something is over there and that the violence and the darkness happens over there, um, that people are expected to, and often quite young people, and you know, we could get into quite a lot about the, the funneling of, of, of kids into the, the US military, but that there's this expectation that you commit acts of, of extreme violence and in terms of the kinds of things that are happening at Guantanamo Bay, and that this is entirely appropriate to uh, if if it's in favour or 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 towards a, a particular political military end, but it's completely inappropriate in the domestic context. Um, again, where we all started. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I I I love that that idea that that um, those very qualities that make that that veteran such a you know a hero. Um, also also make him a villain i i think you're um yeah I, th I i think this really brings together some of the stuff we've been talking about sorry i just think you're right on that i don't know too much to yeah well no thanks very much thanks very much. i do have another question but i'll pass over because i think other people have got their hands up so if we have time i'll, I'll come back if you don't mind later on great thanks, thanks Kevin. thank you paul i'm sure we will have uh, time for your second question later um now we have a hand from nicoletta please Um, yes, I am entirely unsure how to put it down, unfortunately, because I don't even know how to put it up. But um, we've talked about the uh, political leniency of Gothic. So it, it can be both. It can be progressive or it can be transgressive or it can be conservative. But do you think he has a responsibility to be? Or can we take it as a form of art in and of itself without a second, you know, objective. Can we still enjoy Lovecraft regardless of the fact that he was a racist, not really nice person? Yeah, that's a, a very important question for our times, I think. Um, we, um, I, again, I've come back to mention them already, but um, Victor Laval did an introduction to the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft and talked about um, sort of reading Lovecraft and enjoying his fiction, then realizing that he was uh, horrifically racist and uh, as an African American, deciding he couldn't enjoy this. And then coming back to a perspective that is along the lines of that you can, you can criticize someone and, and still appreciate aspects of their work. Now, in some ways that's not very fashionable as well and you can see why um but it's yeah i no you i <laughs> it's part of the generational thing um and i don't want to endorse any any you know evil narratives and there's no doubt that i kind of um enjoy um gothic narratives that that either satirize bad things or or put forward viewpoints i 
agree with, but it, I don't think it can ever be a, a completely morally responsible genre. You know, Fred Botting in one of the most kind of foundational statements says that Gothic is the writing of excess and, and it always has to cross boundaries. It always has to cross boundaries of taste. Um, and I think that's why it's important for us to critique it and to, to take this critical perspective. Uh, because we have to take the the kind of the the bad taste um, with with the good, um, in my view. To to build on that, do you do you think something is more artistic or intrinsically more valuable when it has a political or social message? Like for example, I really speak for myself, but I personally think they are more valuable when they do not give an actual answer like for example uh, funny games or a clockwork orange as films they pose a question which is in one case what is violence without a context and in the other is it more morally good to have a choice to do good or bad or is it more morally good to only have the choice to do good but it don't, doesn't give you an answer that's on on the viewer or on the reader or on, on the person themselves but both films which are held up as 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 works of art right they're 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 generally quite respected on that basis yeah i like that it's, it's decadent the what oscar wilde's uh, idea that all good art is perfectly useless um, um, completely yeah there, there's an element of that i think uh, and an ambiguity when i teach gothic my students get a bit annoyed sometimes about the ambiguity of you know Hawthorne and 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 authors like that. But what actually happened, <laughs> and what are we supposed to think about this? Well, you know that that that's that's part of the medium. I think, yeah, I think that's great. The the aestheticization of um of of violence and of immorality is is in itself interesting. <laughs> anyway, I hope that answers it on some level. Yeah, I, I also completely agree, but um, thank you. Thanks, Nicoletta. Um, uh, Paul, if you want to jump in and ask your second question, I don't think we have uh, any more questions, so feel okay. free. Thanks. Me again, Kevin. Great. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something you, you mentioned, actually. You talked about the Ballad of Black Tom, um, which, is, which is not something that I've read, but I'll definitely go away and, and, and read it. And you talked about how it kind of does this interesting thing about subverting that idea of, of non-white spaces being dangerous. And that kind of led me to, to think of um, the work of Jordan Peele, the filmmaker Jordan Peele, and particularly the, the fantastic movie Get Out, and the way that kind of seems to me to be doing a very similar thing to, to what you mentioned in the novel. I just wanted to ask you for sort of if you've got um, other examples of, of text by, for example, African-Americans or women who are kind of using the gothic as a, as a space to kind of present an alternative and a, and a subversive vision of, of America? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's quite um, a broad ranging uh, question. I think, I, think you'd, um, I think you'd definitely uh, enjoy reading that. There's one of the things that he does is, is, is the, the character in it, what he has to kind of adopt mannerisms of what's expected of him to avoid racism. Um, it takes him back to things like Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and, and those representations of, of being African-American. And interestingly, you know, in Invisible Man, uh, Ralph Ellison talks about how, or the narrator says, I'm not a spook from Edgar Allan Poe or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, so most of my examples are probably quite classic, but I like the, the way in which Toni Morrison has used the Gothic is particularly interesting. Uh, in Beloved, for example, which I was thinking about today because it's essentially a kind of haunted house um, novel about the, the traumas of the past. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm only kind of commenting on those. I mean, Lovecraft Country is the other one. Um, Matt Ruff is, um, is a white author, which is kind of an interesting in terms of the racial politics that we talk about now that we, we think quite a lot about, about people's own identities. Um, but yeah, there's a lot there. there I, I definitely think there's a lot going on. My, I'm not uh, the, the sort of list of, of who to go to is escaping me at the moment. But I think the, the kind of get out comparison um, 
completely works. And that's also about the complacency of, of liberal people. It kind of fits with a lot of James Baldwin's writing, uh, I think, um, about hypocrisy and about using um, sort of uh, African Americans for, for your own ends. Um, I, I was thinking about that in terms of identity today as well. Um, yeah, so sorry, I hope that that, that, that helps. Thank you, Paul, for your wonderful questions. Um, I think we have a question from Monica now. Hi, um, good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for your talk and Sophia for uh, leading the interview. Um, I don't really have a question, but I would, um, you've mentioned uh, Hawthorne in one of your previous answers. And I just wanted um, to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more on your ideas about Hawthorne as a, a figure of the American Gothic, because in, in the previous, um, like most recent um, conversations that you've, um, that we've been having, uh, you, we've been mentioning a lot the African American experience as a topic of American haunted house fictions, and Sophia has also asked you about American imperialism, and um, we found it very interesting. But I, I'm very interested in these foundational figures as well, uh, because th th there seems to be a transition. There's all the all the topics involved, and well, I'm, I'm really passionate about Hawthorne, and I don't know how you you interpret his the appearances of houses in his fiction, which is, uh, there's a, a strong connection with Europe and the Calvinist tradition. And we we'll just wanted you to elaborate a little bit more uh, on that, if you could. No, so it's fascinating. Yeah, that, 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 the preface for the House of the Seven Gables, that the, the mischiefs of the, the past are revisited uh, on the present. Um, that's, yeah, absolutely. The, the kind of house as locus for guilt. The thing that gets me about Hawthorne, I hope I'm not off topic for what you're talking about, but when I first encountered those stories, um, like the Scarlet Letter and his short stories, um, like Young Greenman Brown, of, of, of course, and The Minister's Black Veil, those, those ones that are set in that early Puritan period, I kind of read them, and students make this mistake of kind of reading them as if they're contemporary, uh, with their events. But the really interesting thing about Hawthorne for me is the way he looks back. You know, it's, it's, it's to a period of um, sort of about 150 years before, you know, he's, he's writing. Um, so you get that perspective, don't you? For, it struck me, I may be wrong about this, that we have a trend now for neo-Victorian fiction, which takes a kind of uh, a knowing look back so the, the most recent interesting one I read was The Essex Serpent by Sarah Perry that kind of dips into the minds of the characters and kind of suggests that they couldn't know what, what we know, that, that, that kind of thing that, that John Fells does in the French Lieutenant's Women. But anyway, my, my point is that I think Hawthorne is completely fascinating in terms of being one of the foundational authors of writing a kind of history of that early period but with the benefit of hindsight and with the the knowledge the weight of guilt as well you know there's that biographical detail that his great great grandfather was a judge in the the Salem witch trials um and he's kind of embarrassed isn't he by the the the, the religious fanaticism the superstition and the hysteria and, and scapegoating. Um, and that, that mood has stuck with American Gothic, hasn't it? That, that sense of, of the guilt of the past to come back to, to slavery uh, and, and so on, and how the, the past still lives on in the present. There's that um, uh, famous Faulkner quote, isn't there, that the, the past isn't, isn't even past. Um, so for me, that, 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 that's what Hawthorne does that's, 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 that jumps out at me, I think. Yeah, I, I, I love the idea of the annoying look back. <laughs> I'm just reaching that down that you've mentioned. Yeah, I think Hawthorne's an, a fascinating author because he's one of the only ones that, even though there's a pervasive topic in American Gothic, that, that he's 
I think the only one that goes back in in that sense of like really writing about the past, like none of his, um, he situates himself like hundred years before and, and we're lucky that um, it's not like 500 years, he has it that that recently for him. So, so yeah, um, just been taking notes of very interesting answer. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much. I, so, it, I mean, just struck me because we I was teaching at the same time young Goodman Brown and Herman Melville's Bartleby, yeah. you know, which are written so close together, but one of them seems even more modern than, than, it, than it is, and the other one seems like set in the medieval past, and yet they're, they're, they're contemporary. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, um, I'm glad that's interesting. Yeah. But thanks. Yeah, Hawthorne, yeah. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I also teach these two texts together. <laughs> That's such a coincidence. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And I think we have one final question from Alejandro. Over to you. Yes. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Sofia. Uh, first of all, thank you for this illuminating and very, very thought provoking panel and I wanted to ask you about well you talked about regionalism in the gothic and looking back you just talked about actually uh, but I wanted to ask you about the future of gothic because yes regionalism has a lot to to offer to gothic and in gothic the gothic genre tends to look back on the past but well thinking about it, what do we have to offer to future Gothic authors? I mean, because we are in a globalized world right now, regionalism, you know, is diffuse, is blurring, so to speak, if we think about that in those terms. So what, what's the future of, of Gothic in, in those terms? Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Alejandro. Uh, I think that's really interesting. It brings me back to this previous question about the kind of the um, the slightly revised takes on the Gothic we're we're seeing from authors. Um, one one thing I would I'd recommend is uh, it's a British author actually, but Helen Oyayemi's White is for Witching, which is about race and um, and and the Gothic, and actually we. This kind of expansion of perspectives um, across, we talked earlier about race, class and, and, and gender and, and things like sexuality. I think the, the range of authors working in this field and using the, using the, the traditional storylines of the Gothic for their own ends is probably the most transformative thing that, that, that we're seeing. Because traditionally, again, to go back to that early Gothic thing, it's kind of about um, people who see themselves as the, the mainstream dominant culture worrying about this weird, <laughs> crazy person over here and, and othering, that, that's, that's at the heart of, of the Gothic. Um, but we're starting to see some of those narratives turned around a little bit. And again, um, globalized, you know, I talked about um, Mexico as, as kind of the, the US as other, but if we look at things like the recent sort of Mexican Gothic um, and kind of the, um, the ways in which people are, are using these narratives and also reclaiming some of the, the ghosts and spirits and monsters of all of these narratives have such different meanings in their, in their, their native contexts and they've been completely misrepresented, which is fun. <laughs> but there's also a lot more potential to to explore um, these myths and 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 stories that the Gothic draws on. I think um, that seems to me to be the near future, just a, a, a wider range of perspectives and, and viewpoints. I, d I don't know if you agree if that's how you would see it. Going. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That I I totally agree. I think always re recovering some myths, some otherness is always the path, I think, in this, in this genre. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Alejandro, for your wonderful question. And I think that talking about the present and the future 
I was like, I'll take it's a perfect place to uh, put an end to today's session. So yeah, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna ask everyone who feels comfortable with it to turn their cameras on so that we can uh, have a virtual round of applause for Kevin. Here we go. Hey, hey thank you, Kevin. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And yeah, hopefully we'll meet again soon uh, to discuss all things Gothic. Uh, so yeah, see ya. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And Bye. thanks to our public as well that some faces we already know, some we will see again. So thank you very much to everybody.